Let's bring in our buddy Grant McCauley. He, of course, is our Braves insider. MLB covers Major League Baseball for us here. And uh, Grant, opening day just a couple of days away. I'm curious, before we get into some personnel conversations, World Series or bust? Is that where we're at? Are we mm. in this window with the Braves where we've gotten, you know, five straight NL East titles? We're in our window. How how much longer are we in this window? Yeah, I think we're in that window right now, most definitely. And it's hard to look at this season for the Braves and say that anything short of a trip to the World Series is what any of these guys have in mind. And having won a World Series, what year before last, a lot of the fans have that on their mind, too. So I would most definitely, you know, just buy the bumper sticker, I guess, World Series or bust and slap it on the Braves bandwagon because I think it's going to be there for a while. And I think it's a pretty great thing to be able to say, considering, you know, you have won one. That was, you know, step one. And they continue to find ways to get into October. Now you just want to see them finish this thing off and build a dynasty of sorts. And the Braves definitely have the personnel to make that kind of thing happen. And they've locked up this core for quite a while. So, yeah, long story short, World Series or bust, let's print it. <laughs> Excellent. The young pitchers, we heard Alex Anthopoulos on the Steakhouse today. What do you make of that? Kind of seeing what these guys can do. Dodd and Schuster tested them a little bit to see how they handle the pressure. Yeah, I think that it's always good to look at your roster and make as many decisions as you can. And there will be some that are nuanced. And I know we can talk about shortstop and it kind of going the other way. But you know, taking the best 26 north, and, and maybe that's just what this boils down to. We saw Ian Anderson struggle so mightily last year. Then he come into spring training, and it didn't look like much had changed. And I know that it didn't give him a long time. And I kind of thought, well, I guess if you know, you're not really sold on either of the youth, then maybe you just let Ian Anderson figure it out at the big league level. But when you are a contender and you are in that window, it's hard to let guys go out and, quote, unquote, figure it out and struggle at the major league level. So I, I like giving them a challenge. And I think what they showed in spring training was an ability to go out and throw strikes, attack the zone. They haven't been afraid in any of their opportunities against major league opposition. And I feel like, yeah, you just kind of find out what they have. We know, as I've said so many times, we're not getting through the year with just five starting pitchers. It's just not going to be a thing. But I think that these are guys that the Braves feel very strongly about being able to get out at the big league level, and they're going to test them in these first couple of series. So I'm excited to see what they do. Grant, as far as our division, uh, I still think it's ours to lose. But just quickly, let, let's run down these other teams, specifically Mets, Phillies, who who makes a jump? Who takes a jump this year? Um, and is this the most competitive division in baseball, in your opinion? I think it, it has to be. If if not, I mean, what's the other one? I mean, maybe the American League East is always that division as well. I mean, the Orioles got better last year. The Rays are always plucky. The Red Sox took a step back. The Yankees were doing their thing. And the Blue Jays are a really good team. Then you look over at the NL East. You know, the Mets have spent more money than just about anybody that we can think of in recent memory. The Phillies also spent a whole bunch of money in the offseason. The Braves in this division, and I just did a National League East preview series on From the Diamond that you can find in the archives over the last three weeks, including a long look at all four of these teams. And both the Phillies and the Mets guests that I had said, look, we know that the path through October for the National League East is going to go through the Braves. Everybody wants to unseat the Atlanta Braves. And I think the Marlins could take a step forward if you're asking me who makes a jump this year. I'm not convinced that the Phillies are going to be altogether that much better than they were last year in the regular season, but they proved the same thing that the Braves proved the year before. Get hot in October, and it doesn't really matter if you have the most wins in the league come, you know, game number, number 162. Meanwhile, the Mets, I mean, they've got some unfinished business. They won as many games as the Braves last year, and they also went home in the first round of the playoffs, just like the Braves did last year as well. So mm. I do think it's an ultra-competitive division. I feel like this is a three-team race as much as anything, and if the Phillies can get Bryce Harper back sooner than later, that'll help them make up for losing Reese Hoskins for the year. That's a big blow for them that happened in the final week of spring training. Mets didn't sign Carlos Correa, but you look all around that team, you know, losing Edwin Diaz hurts them as well. So everybody's kind of dealing with their own things. It's not just the Braves losing to Glacius or not having Kyle Wright at the start of the year. It's just going to be one of those battles, and I'm excited to see what comes out of it. And again, we lost to Cunha for the year World Series run. You know, Albies last year. Yeah. Again, world's smallest violin mm -hmm. for those big spending fills and Mets. It's uh, our man Grant McCauley with us here. By the way, speaking of the Phillies, the JT Real Muto thing with uh, uh, the umpire oh. yesterday. Are we going to see a lot of this? And what, again, what people didn't see was Kimbrell got called for a ball for taking too much time on the mound, and then this is Real Muto pulled his thing. Are we going to see a lot of uh, aggravation behind the plate and this kind of stuff during this? I know Ma Manfred sent out that the new rule and trying to give some flexibility. Yeah, I think that they want to, as much as possible, have a little bit of common sense applied to these situations. But that real Muto ejection, 
There, there was no common sense involved in that. That's just to find out a mix up. And that, you know, we saw that video make the rounds yesterday. I don't know if they'll be exactly that pronounced as far as some of these incidents go, but I think there's going to be some surprise for different guys who are like, wait, no, I was there. I was doing this, or I was where I was supposed to be, or I was about to do what I was supposed to do at that time. But I feel like as much as I've talked to minor league uh, officials and some players and some broadcasters about what was it like getting used to the pitch clock last year, they said, yeah, there's this influx in the first month or six weeks, and then you start to just kind of get with the program. Now, the interesting thing for me, I, I think, is I don't really care about the pitch clock over the first seven or so innings. When you get into high-pressure situations in the eighth and ninth inning and we're not just kind of letting the game breathe a little bit, that doesn't happen in spring training. It wasn't happening in the World Baseball Classic because it didn't use the clock at all. So we haven't really seen the biggest moments with the biggest players with everything on the line, and the clock is running. So I want to see how that whole thing plays out. Tell us about these two lefties, man. we got two lefties in the rotation. Uh, I don't know how they're going to fare, but, boy, I thought they proved themselves in spring training. Yeah, and the ability to go out and just attack hitters, throw strikes, miss bats, which they both did. Jared Schuster's got a really nice changeup. He got the most time in AAA last year with 10 total appearances. Dylan Dodd got up for one start, so he signed the guest book in Gwinnett last year. And, you know, I just feel like as we got into spring training and saw all the usual suspects, the Ian Andersons, Bryce Elders, Michael Soroka, those are the guys we were talking about. Maybe throw Colby Allard's name in there. We knew about them. But Schuster and Dodd were kind of the dark horse candidates or just the, the guys that were there to have a big league camp and get some experience. And they end up being the most impressive. And I saw them throw on the backfields against big league hitters, including Ronald Acuna Jr., Eddie Rosario, Matt Olson. Dylan Dodd was just punching everybody out. And we saw that throughout the course of spring training. It's just a nice, easy, repeatable delivery. He's already used to the pitch clock, and, and so is Jared Schuster, I believe. So that shouldn't be something that rattles these guys. You just have to be able to, I think as much as anything, have that recognition that, hey, I belong here. Go attack these lineups. And I think that the Braves should be pretty happy with the results of spring training is any indication. It is our man G Money. By the way, I know we talked about the bullpen. That's about it. Is the only area that really concerns or should concern Braves fans the shortstop position? And yeah, because I know we've already gotten past the Grissom not coming up thing, but Arcia, and then is that basically your only concern? I don't know if I'm really even that concerned about Orlando Arcia because we are talking about the ninth hitter on the club. And having seen what he did last year, I mean, he was really – he came in and, and played some really important games when Ozzie Albies went down to help the Braves at second base. Now, obviously, he got an injury scare, and that brought up Von Grissom, and it obviously launched our whole discussion that we've been having for several months. I don't know that I'm overly concerned about that position. I just feel that if the Braves want to reassess that, they have the depth to do that. Iglesias not being available at the start of the year, not having your closer, I think concerns a lot of teams. But when you do look at the Braves' bullpen depth, and I saw uh, a recent post on Fangraphs, I mean, the Braves were rated the number one bullpen in baseball. Throw that on top of the fact that most, if not all, the projection systems like the Braves to maybe win the most games in the National League this year. And we're in some weird uncharted territory where all of a sudden the projections <laughs> – like the Atlanta Braves, and that has not felt like the thing when you're basically getting win forecasts of 85, 87, 88 wins, whatever it is. The Braves, I think, have finally sold people, and one of the big things that does it is having the layers of quality depth that the Braves do. I think they've got enough of that in left field. I think they've got enough of it at shortstop, and if Iglesias is only down for a couple of weeks, this bullpen with all of the veterans and the guys with experience that, that the Braves have should be able to cover for that, and then obviously you want to get Kyle Wright back as soon as possible. That's probably the only other area that I'm really i don't know if holding my breath is is the right word for it or phrase for it but i would like to see him back sooner than later and i know the Braves would too great stuff uh grant can't wait thursday uh again opening day for baseball for us but it's not our home opener that will happen the following week uh and we'll talk more about that as we get closer and closer grant have a great day man take care yeah, you too. Excited for another season of Braves baseball and talking with you guys just about every day. No doubt. Right on. Starts in D.C. Then we'll be out there next Thursday and Friday right at Murph's, right? Yeah. Uh, two days back-to-back right. at Murph's, man. Thursday and Friday.